came about, um, you know, there's a dispute. Steve Bedore, who worked for me when I was in the house, he claims uh, that, that it was his idea. And what happens is, Seth, they come up with ideas, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just forget if they really did come up with it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Steve, he left the uh, state senate, served with distinction in the state senate. He's now a, uh, a lawyer at uh, McDermott, Will and Emory, and doing very, very well. But here's my recollection of it. Um, Steve did mention, we talked about different ways that we could reach out. But I was elected in 1992, and I got together with, I, had, I ran a campaign that talked about the need to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And in fact, uh, I took a lot of my ideas about manufacturring from Paul Saunders' presidential campaign. Because he talked, but basically what Paul said was that, you know, if you want to create wealth, that we, you could have a redistribution of wealth, then, you got to create it first, which means we have to think and focus about on manufacturing. So I got together with Bob Franks, a Republican from New Jersey, and uh, you know he said, you know, I was reading some of the things that you talked about in your campaign. That's exactly what I talked about. So we got together and established the first ever manufacturing task force within the Congress, and we did it through the Northeast Midwest Congressional Coalition. We had hearings around the country, but I became very close with Bob, and he said to me. Uh, you know, I want you, I invite people down from my district, I want you to come and, and speak. You know, he said, we need a Democrat for balance, so we want you there. I said, that's great. So I went over and, and, and actually it was an event, um, not quite like this, but when I saw it, and staff members had mentioned, I said, we're going to do this, uh, we're going to do this in my district too. But Bob Franks was, uh, was a guy who um, sort of got me thinking, if he's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And it has grown every year, and when Nikki invited me to come and speak, I would, I started thinking about you know all the years and the, and the speakers that we had, and I uh, I have sort of wrote down a list of the people like Mark Shields, uh, Paul Begala, Koki Roberts, uh, Sam Donaldson, uh, Judge Stephanopoulos, who I think was Nikki had here last year, James Carvel. Uh, we had Ted Leonsis. Uh, Ted Leonsis uh, is somebody who grew up in Lowell. I actually attended uh, UMass Lowell my first year. He then transferred to Georgetown, but he now owns a basketball team in Washington and the Capitals. And, uh, and he spoke uh, one year. Thinking about members of, uh, of the Senate, uh, and, and the other thing that's interesting, both candidates for president uh, this year, uh, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, spoke uh, at Fifth District Day. And uh, actually both candidates last time did, because John McCain was a regular uh, here in Fifth District Day. John and I uh, worked together on campaign finance reform. And um, I really enjoyed working with John, John McCain. He's a, he's a great American hero. And he would come uh, pretty much every year. And I always felt in the presidential campaign, I don't know, how many people have seen the, the movie, the HBO movie, um, yeah, Game Changer? It kind of captures it. I mean, really, he wanted to pick Lieberman so bad. And they just told him, no way, no way, no way. And it's interesting, you know, you run for president, John was a, a pretty independent, is a pretty independent guy, but as he wanted to get the Republican nominee for president, he was moving, kept moving to the right, moving to the right, moving to the right. I, I almost didn't recognize him by the end of the campaign. But, uh, but John was a, was a regular here. Uh, members of the, of the Senate, Tom Daschle uh, spoke, Chris Dodd, uh, Russ Feingold, who was a Democratic sponsor of campaign finance reform, uh, Mary Landry, the senator from Louisiana, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, another Republican uh, who I work with on campaign uh, finance reform. Um, a lot of members of the House, uh, Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel uh, came and spoke at 5th District Day a number of times before he was elected to Congress. He served in the, uh, in the Clinton White House and uh, we got friendly in those days and then he ended up uh, coming in and, and uh, becoming a member of the House. And uh, we used to have dinner on a regular basis with a group of uh, folks. He then uh, went on to be the, uh, President Obama's chief of staff and now he's the mayor of Chicago. And I would want, not want to be anyone that gets in his way as mayor of Chicago because Brown is a tough, tough guy. Uh, John Lewis, a uh, great civil rights uh, leader, congressman from uh, Georgia, was a regular here. I think there are two folks that probably have the record uh, for most appearances. One, uh, both of them you're going to hear from, Nancy Pelosi and also John Kerry. I think that the two of them have probably been to every single one. So there should be some kind of award, I think, for, for them. Uh, Peter King, a Republican from uh, New York, was a regular, Chris Shays. Uh, Ron Dullums. Ron Dullums, how many people remember that name, Ron Dullums? Great. Ron Dullums was, uh, 
he was a Black Panther in Berkeley. I mean, he was a very liberal guy, and he wasn't the type of guy who you would think would be uh, on the Armed Services Committee. And um, uh, Ron was a great, great human being, and, um, and he was on the Armed Services Committee. He eventually rose to become the, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. He was such a fear. Uh, chairman, he was fabulous, and I really enjoyed uh, getting to know and becoming friendly with him. He then left the Congress, became the mayor of Oakland, um, and uh, I saw him recently. Uh, there was an event for Ike Skelton, another former chairman of the Armed Services Committee. I saw him run there, and we're going to get him up to the uh, to the university. Pat Schroeder, uh, remember Pat Schroeder, the um, congresswoman from Colorado. Pat was a regular uh, for many years. It's kind of interesting, you know. She ran for president. And remember that there was this big to-do because she had tears and they said that she cried and we couldn't have a president that cried. It was the craziest thing. I mean, we have a speaker of the house that can cry on the drop of a dime. I mean, literally on the drop of a dime. But it shows you how times change and, and it's just amazing. Um, I, also, uh, I also took some time to think about uh, those folks who have come here uh, for 5th District Day, who are no longer with us. Uh, Joe Moakley, the great uh, chair of the Rules Committee. Uh, Joe was a regular here, and he was a great member of Congress, uh, uh, worked very well across the aisles, and uh, uh, we all miss him very much. I had a, a friend, Jack Murtha. Jack was a, uh, a great guy, and I see some of us here who uh, also work with Jack. Uh, Jack was a, a member, a conservative member from Pennsylvania. And, you know, I really didn't have very much in common with Jack, you know, I mean, Jack would be on the floor, but I had a great relationship with him. He'd be on the floor, he'd say, man, you got another reform? What, what are you trying to, tell me why I'm against this reform, because you know I'm against it, you know, but we had a great relationship. And when you serve on the, uh, on the Armed Services Committee, you really have to have a good relationship with the appropriators. And Jack and I had a fabulous relationship. And uh, Jack, uh, unfortunately, uh, went into one of the military hospitals for an operation, and uh, there were complications that he didn't come out. But I miss Jack very, very much. Uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, Ted came every single year, and you know we miss him uh, uh, personally, but also the state misses him. And you know I think of all the times that he came. I think of one time in particular, he had two dogs uh, that he would bring around with him, uh, particularly towards the, the end of his uh, tenure. Uh, Sonny and Splash, and he came in the 5th District right, with Sonny and Splash, and my two boys, Bobby and Daniel, were there, and they were very young, and they ran up, and the dogs were running around, they were barking, and I don't know if anyone was here, that but it, I mean, it literally took 10 minutes to calm everything down, but, uh, but we missed Ted very much, he came, uh, he came every year, and uh, his impact, you know, I, I, um, when I think of those folks who have served here and uh, the effectiveness of people who have served here. <clears throat> I don't think there was ever a more effective member of the United States Senate than Ted Kennedy. He worked both sides of the aisle very, very effectively. And um, so I was thinking about, uh, about Ted as I was thinking about coming here. Um, Ron Brown, as Steve Bedore mentioned, uh, the, the Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown, under Bill Clinton. Uh, Ron was here, um, uh, spoke to our group, and just a matter of less than a week later, he took a trip to Croatia. And if you've ever been to Croatia, you, you come in, it was a rainstorm, but you, there are mountains you come over, and then it's just beautiful as you get down. Well, it was a rainstorm, and, and the plane hit the back, and, and Ron, uh, Ron died. But he was, uh, he was a great, uh, great person, and uh, um, it was a, a terrible tragedy. Uh, I think of some of the press people that have come who aren't here. Uh, Bob Novak, do you remember Bob Novak? He was on Crossfire. You know, kind of a crusty conservative guy, and he used to always go at me when we did crossfire, and he was tough, but but he was a good guy. And uh, uh, Bob has uh, has passed away. Mary McGrory, Mary would also come. The Washington Post correspondent. Mary was a fabulous uh, reporter, and another a woman sort of ahead of her time, cutting edge. She was uh, she was fabulous, and. Uh, and she's no longer here, but I, I was thinking about, uh, about Mary, and uh, Mary used to have parties where she'd invite the folks that she knew, usually Democrats, uh, but she'd invite people from the administration, and when you, when you went to Mary's house for a party, she required everyone there to perform in some way, whether it was something from high school, uh, a poem, uh, an imitation, a song, she had a piano, if you played the piano you played it, and, and it was just a really, uh, she was a wonderful person, but ahead of her time, again, she was a, uh, a great reporter when women 
weren't, uh, weren't really in those, uh, in those roles. I mentioned Bob Franks uh, from New Jersey. Bob was about my, uh, my age. Bob Franks, uh, he was a, Democrat, a Republican nominee for governor, uh, ran for the United States Senate. He ended up, uh, it's kind of a weird thing, I hadn't seen him in years, and they give former members seats to the uh, inauguration of president, so I, I get seated with all the people there right next to Bob Franks. And uh, about six months later that, uh, that Bob got cancer and, and passed away and left a, a young family. He was a fabulous person. And, and, and the, the other person I thought about was Tim Russett. Uh, Tim Russett uh, com came uh, to 5th District uh, Day a number of times. Uh, I got to know him uh, through uh, different things that I was on the Judiciary Committee during the impeachment and also uh, uh, on Meet the Press, they covered a lot of the campaign finance uh, things. But uh, Tim was a great, great journalist. Uh, you know, he was tough. Uh, but he was fair and he was great and uh, you know he's another one who I think is uh, that is sorely missed. Uh, the district's going to change. What a great history the 5th District has. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking last night, E is North Rogers, um, who uh, John Jacob Rogers had the seat and then E is North Rogers took his place, served longer than, than any woman uh, that it, until recently that ever served in the Congress. Barbara Mikulski uh, from Maryland uh, now has that record, but I think that Edith North Rogers is still number one in terms of the House of Representatives. We've always had great uh, representation uh, in the 5th District, uh, great, great leadership. Edith North Rogers, she used to, see, you know, Lowell and Lawrence used to play each other on Thanksgiving. And I can tell you, and I'm sure Nikki gets, sometimes Lowell and Lawrence are these cities that view themselves competing all the time, and if you're from Lowell, you got to go overboard to make sure, you know, the people in Lawrence think you're okay with them and they're back and forth. But uh, Edith North Rogers used to, the first half of the game should sit on one side and then the second half should sit on the other side, the Lowell Lawrence football game. And she would rotate it every year. So that if she was first in Lowell, she'd transfer and then go over the other way. Uh, so uh, then, of course, it was Brad Morse, who was an outstanding member of Congress, who Paul had interned uh, with, uh, uh, and I think that's when, Paul and Nikki met one another. Uh, but Brad was a great member of Congress, went to the uh, UN. We had Paul Cronin, who served uh, one term. I, Paul and I both defeated Paul Cronin. He served one term, but he was really, uh, you know, he's a good, moderate uh, Republican. He was, a, he was a great guy. I think the standard for representation of this district really was set by, by Paul Songus. And, and what it was about was, it was about, your job sure was coming to Washington, and people wanted you to to play a natural leadership role on issues. But also, uh, Paul believed that you could play a really fundamentally important role in economic development back in your district. So that, it, that if you were a member of Congress, you could be a catalyst to bring business into the room, to get local government to move in the right direction. And, and he really did set the standard for how that was to be done. And I knew that because uh, when, uh, when Jim Shannon took Paul's place in the, in the House, uh, I worked for Jim, and, and it was a challenge to try to set up the office in a way that played that economic development role uh, that, that Paul had insisted on, not only as a House member, but also in the, in the United States Senate, where you would have an economic development project going on in Fall River, and they'd, uh, they'd get a call from Senator Song and say, I, wa I want to set up a meeting about this project to move it forward. He fundamentally understood cities and understood why it was so important to develop private-public partnerships uh, that would be beneficial uh, to cities. So I really think Paul did set the standard, and, and, uh, and, and Jim Shannon was a great member. Chet Atkins was a great member, served on the Appropriations Committee, was very effective in terms of bringing, those were in the days when they actually allowed earmarks. So, uh, you know, Chet was a, a senior member of that committee, and, and uh, so we have had a great history, I think, uh, in, this, uh, in this district. Um, I thought I'd talk a couple of minutes about the university, then open it up to questions or comments that uh, any of you have. Uh, let me just say, it, 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 is, it is great to come down here. I get down here every couple of months, usually on university business. But people say to me, do you miss the Congress? And, you know, you miss the relationships. But one of the great things about uh, having Nikki Sagas uh, take my place is that there is never a moment where I think, we're missing something in terms of leadership in the 5th District. And it's a great feeling to have because uh, this district is, is important, the representation is important, and I can't think of anyone who, uh, who I'd rather see representing this district in Congress. And you can see, the great thing about it is, you, you, you can see as she's here a little longer, as she's, you know, you look at issues like, uh, I mentioned last night, uh, sexual assault in the military, and you see the effectiveness 
of raising an issue, raising it in committee, using the committee process to get attention on the issue, then you see the Secretary of, uh, of Defense acting on that. That's effective leadership, and that's how members of Congress are effective. And Nikki uh, has been really effective, and, it, and, and it's great to come, come back here and to feel good about the representation that the people of Massachusetts and the people of the 5th District uh, have. Um, I served for 14 and a half years. I, I, uh, I think it's not a bad thing for folks to move on and do something else, and I want to do it early enough where I could get into a different field and have the energy that I needed to have to, uh, to, uh, do, uh, in order to, uh, uh, to do it. I, uh, people say to me, how did you end up thinking about running a university? I actually about, oh, probably 10 years ago now, five years before that, I went to a firm in Boston, and I, uh, they're called New Directions. And I said, I don't want to be in Congress the rest of my life, and I want to figure out what I should be doing. And they're a company that works with ex-CEOs, and, and they try to help you figure out, well, what are you good at? They, you bring in five people that know you really well, they're on a high level, and, and they interview them. They have a staff psychologist. I get nervous when I had to meet with a staff psychologist. So. But, um, but I spent some time there, and, and basically, a month later, after all of these tests and interviews and things, they came back to me and said, you have two passions that we think you ought to tap into. One is, you're a great marketer, um, we think you love of sports, we think you'd be great to run a professional sports league. The NFL, Major League Baseball, something like that. And the other thing they said is, we think uh, higher education, that you would be very good in higher education. Today, in higher education, they're looking for people who are uh, effective leaders, uh, people who know how to listen, people who know how to raise money, people that, uh, that, that know how to get folks around to aspire to be greater. And uh, so I got on the board of trustees of a, of a university, uh, Suffolk University, so that I would get a little bit of exposure and then got myself more involved in, in public higher education and higher education generally. Um, it's been great at the university. Um, we've, uh, you know, we have really d demanded excellence in everything that we do. In, by any metric you'd evaluate, this is my fifth year at the university, but any metric you'd use, we are headed on an upward trajectory. We've increased enrollment by 37%. Why do we do that? Because Massachusetts is a state that doesn't make the kind of investment in public higher education that many other states make. So, so the students actually pay more than what the state does. Our budget is about 22% comes from the state. And, and so we need to run these institutions like private institutions. So we grew in enrollment where we had the capacity to do it. But the fabulous thing about it is, at the same time we're building enrollment, we're becoming more selective in the students that we accept. What do I mean by that? Well, the last, the last five years, the average SAT score, math, science combined, and UMass all is up 45 points. And this freshman class that we're admitting will be up another 10 to 15 points. Uh, why do we want to be selective? Because we want to increase our graduation rates. Uh, we think that there are plenty of opportunities that students have in terms of access with great community colleges, uh, with great uh, state uh, universities. So we're looking to become, because we are the highest level of public higher education, we want to become a world-class university. And for the first time, Nikki mentioned the long history since the 1890s. For the first time, many of you know U.S. News and World Report, they rate universities on all kinds of levels, but they have a top tier that, that they rate. They take, of the 3,700 colleges and universities in the country, they rate about 200 of them that they rate as top tier. And for the first time in the history of this institution, we're in the top tier, first time ever, two years ago, and we moved up uh, 12 spots. And we're gonna continue uh, to move up. We're in the top 100 public universities in the country. We've increased our research portfolio by 64%. What does that mean? It's important to have a research institution. When Nikki talks about the economic development that can be created, research institutions are conducting research. That research develops technologies that create companies and create jobs. And UMass Hall has always had an emphasis on those, uh, that research that has a high likelihood of commercialization. So it's a critically important role. The Emerging Technologies Innovation Center that we're building, an $80 million uh, research building, has the potential to have literally dozens of spin-off companies that come about as a result. We're working with 50 companies now that want to use our cutting edge high bay labs and clean rooms because they're too expensive uh, for small companies to have. So, uh, so that's been a great part of what we've done. Uh, diversity. When I got to Lowell, the first, one of the first things that hit me was the, the campus wasn't diverse. 
I talked to a vice chancellor that was there and I said, what's with this campus? It, it feels all white to me. And this woman said, well, we serve primarily the Merrimack Valley and that's pretty much all white. I said, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. I said, you know, Lawrence right down the road is 85% Hispanic. And do you know where those bright Hispanic students that are, that, that are in Lawrence that either graduate from Lawrence High School, tops of their class, or they graduate from Central Catholic? They're going to Merrimack, they're going to Stonehill, they're going to other places because we're not aggressive enough about going in and getting those students. We've increased students from diverse backgrounds in five years by 73%. And we now have an inclusive community at the university. There's another time that I went into, I tend sometimes to micromanage and those who have uh, worked for me will probably attest to that. But I go into the rec center from time to time and work out. And a few years ago, I was in the rec center and we had had a good year in terms of diversity. I went over to get my towel, you know, there's a white person gave me my towel, and then I went over to get my locker, there was a white person working there. Finally, I looked around, and of the six people that were working at the rec center, they all were white. So I called the athletic director, because they, they run, I said, hey, what's going on over at the rec center? He said, well, I don't know, you over there, what? I don't know, what's going on? I said, Every, everyone who works here, well, you know, we have a really diverse group of people working out here. I mean, people from all kinds of backgrounds. But every time you go to get something, the person behind, them, they're white. Sends the wrong message, you know? And I've never had that happen again, ever again. So our environment is uh, much more uh, diverse. Our graduation rates are up. The uh, Chronicle of Higher Education uh, cited UMass Lowell. We had the highest increase in graduation rates of any public university in New England. There's a national group called payscale.com, and they measure how much graduates make at a university uh, mid-career. In two out of the last three years, payscale.com has rated UMass Lowell number one in terms of the medium, median mid-career salary of our graduates. That's a big deal, particularly when you look at the fact that graduates are, are increasingly graduating with, with alarming amounts of debt. So it's very important that we have programs that are real life, prepare students uh, for real work in the real world. We become more international. Um, we, uh, we have signed 70 agreements uh, with the national, uh, international universities uh, in 26 different countries. Why do we do that? Because universities today, if you want to be a world class university, you have to prepare students to be globally competent. It's a global world. Any of you that are in business know that. You, you have to be globally competent. And you can't be globally competent, have your students be globally competent, if they don't have opportunities to study overseas, if they don't have international students who are there, or if 95% of the students are all from Massachusetts. You have to have diversity in every way. So uh, we're, we're, we're becoming more diverse in terms of our international students. We're providing more opportunities for students to study. We had a group of students that go to Belfast because we have a relationship with Queen's University uh, there. Uh, I visited Queen's and, and had gotten involved in, uh, in, in Northern Ireland when I was in the house. And uh, we're doing this big event at Queen's and I get this emergency co phone call from Jerry Adams and he says, you gotta go over to St. Mary's, you're not going to Queen's without going to St. Mary's. So we established a relationship with them as well. Dublin City University is another uh, institution, research institution. We collaborate with faculty, we collaborate on research and it's been fabulous. And I, the other thing that we do, we reposition the university in the first five years, but I believe in order to make a difference at a university, you need to be there 10 years. And we're planning the next five years as we continue uh, the growth. Uh, the buildings that uh, Nikki has had mentioned, uh, we're building a new business school. Uh, we're building a new uh, social sciences building on the south side of the river as well as the emerging technology. We're increasing the number of students that live on campus. Statistically, students that live on campus have a higher likelihood of academic success. So, uh, so we've increased that as well. With that, uh, I'll take a couple of questions uh, if any of you have. I, I see my former colleague is is here, but I'd be glad to take any questions, but I thank you for, uh, for listening. Comments or questions? Steve, do you, do, you, do you have anything you want to say? Great. Thank you very much, great to talk. Yes, yes, John. Chancellor, you do a remarkable job. How's the endowment um, yeah, I didn't get to that. We've, we've raised uh, 65, raised or got, gotten pledges of 65 million uh, over the last five years. People thought I raised a lot of money when I was in Congress. This is, I mean, that's this. Um, so we've, we've just about doubled our endowment um, and we're continuing to do that. What I've found is alums who are doing well 
they want to have confidence in the leadership and the direction the university is headed in. And so we couldn't just arrive and just say, well, we did start raising money right away. But in order to get John Policino, an alum, he just committed $4 million uh, for scholarships for endowment. Uh, Rob Manning, former chair of the board, he committed $6 million. They want to see the direction that you're headed in. They want to see what your strategic plan is. They want to see what kind of leadership you're bringing in. I mean, it, you know, a lot of times I feel as though I get, I get too much of the credit because I happen to be the head of the organization. But every time we have a search, we get the best person that we possibly can get. We went out and got the provost at Northeastern University, who's a fabulous, internationally known uh, uh, provost. We hire the best people we get. Sometimes we hire the best people. We have a national search, and they come from within the institution. Julie Chen, who's vice uh, provost for, uh, for research, is an example of that. She's really been the architect, in many ways, of our National Science Foundation bio nano manufacturing center. So uh, we're raising money. Um, any, any of you that are interested in helping out, whether you're uh, from Providence or whether you're from uh, Massachusetts, we, uh, uh, we're always raising money. In fact, uh, we have an event every year uh, before commencement, pre-commencement event, that we, uh, that we raise money for scholarships. The cost of, uh, of higher education is going to continue to go up. I will, I, I'll leave on this note. The co and John knows this, but because uh, John is, uh, is involved in public higher education, John Tierney is anyone. The cost, if you factor in inflation, the cost of an education at the University of Massachusetts, in fact all of public higher education in Massachusetts, when you factor in inflation, actually hasn't gone up. In fact, it's slightly gone down when you factor in inflation. What has shifted, say in the three decades since I was at, at, at UMass Lowell, when 88% of the budget came from the state. What has shifted is who pays for it. It's gone from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts onto the backs of students. That's why your question is so fundamentally important. I'm not going to cut back on the quality of my institution. I'm unwilling to do that. We're not going to, we're not going to become, we're headed in this direction, not this direction. So we're borrowing more money, we're investing more money, we need to, we're entrepreneurial about bringing more money in from non-state sources. But part of that equation means we have to be more aggressive with our alums that have done well to give back to the institution because we need to be accessible all the time. We meet about 94% of the uh, statistic financial aid need that we have. And, and that's pretty good. We have to continue to do it, make it better and better and better. So that's an important part of it. People kid about fundraising. The fact of the matter is we're not going to be accessible to, to everyone if we're not able to, uh, to, to, half of our students get significant financial aid. By significant, I mean half of what it costs. We need to continue to do better in that light. And uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that uh, when I got to the university, I didn't have to learn how to do. I knew how to do that right at the beginning. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Marty for being here on this, the last 5th District Day. You can see the intensity and vision that he brings to everything he does and uh, the extraordinary accomplishments that come about as a result. But in honor of the fact that this is the last 5th District Day, a couple of years ago I had a local artist, uh, Janet Lambert Moore, uh, do a representational um, uh, a watercolor of the 5th District. So it has different elements drawn from across the 5th and I wanted to present this to Marty and thank him so much for his service to our country. And you can see what a public service really is. Marty went through the list of the various speakers that he hosted in his tenure here. Just a remarkable educational opportunity that came about as a result of uh, these legislative seminars. And just what people are able to, who you're able to see and hear from and what you take back with you. So thank you, Marty, for initiating this. And we do our darndest to keep it going and keep it at the same level that you established. It's great to have here today with us my colleague, uh, Representative John Tierney. Following redistricting, redistricting, three towns that I currently represent will join John's district. I'm sorry to lose them. They're remarkable communities that uh, we've worked hard to get to know and be engaged in. Uh, but I know that John will do a great job representing them, and they are Bill Ricca, Tewksbury, and a part of Andover. I look forward to working together on issues that affect the Merrimack Valley more broadly. We certainly are committed to doing that.
This is John's eighth term representing Massachusetts 6th District. He has been an active leader on education and labor issues and serves as the only member from Massachusetts on the Education and Labor Committee. He's been leading the House effort, Democratic effort to make sure that college students don't see their student loan rates double at the end of June, and I'm sure you've all been following that. His hard work and commitment to ensuring the legislative branch conducts vigorous oversight earned John the chairmanship of the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform uh, during the years 2007 to 2010. So with that, I welcome Congressman John Tierney. Good morning, everybody. So Nikki's right, we, uh, we kept every single city and town that we had in the 6th district, we kept the number 6 on the district as well, uh, so we don't have to go through this transition on that. But we did pick up two full communities, Tewksbury and Bill Ricker, and parts of Andover. To so show you how fine our state legislature was, we got precincts 1, precincts 8, one quarter of precinct 7, <laughs> and 14 voters in precinct 9. So we're in search of those 14. We're going to hold a block party you know, and get to meet everybody on that. But I look forward to serving uh, with Nikki as well and representing uh, Andover. And I know she won't let go of her interest, um, uh, Bill Ricker and Tewksbury as well. And we've already been working on the I-93 issue uh, and a number of others. I don't have to tell you, I will a little bit, but I don't have to tell you what a great job Nikki has done here in Congress. Uh, you're all familiar, this isn't your first rodeo, you've been here on previous occasions, but every time you've gotten to see the respect and high regard which she's held, got to see the work that she's done, particularly in the Armed Services Committee and how meaningful that is uh, to not just the 5th District, but to the 6th and the 7th and actually the entire Commonwealth on that. She very clearly was a quick learner uh, and has taken the leadership role on a number of matters that are really significant and vital. And so uh, I'm just pleased to have her as a colleague and happy to be here with you this morning. I was going to talk to you somewhat about the, uh, the committees that I serve on, but I, you're going to have to narrow that down a bit. Well, one of my committees is Government uh, Oversight and Reform, which has a wide array. It covers every department and agency in the government, and the full committee uh, can take up any issue it wants, even though each of the committees has an oversight aspect to it. This is sort of the one that goes for all of those entities that have overlapping jurisdiction or that may fall between the cracks somewhere else and reach uh, a level of immediacy that needs attention. My particular subcommittee, the one that I chaired for four years and now the ranking member on that is National Security and Foreign Policy, which got us into a lot of matters, everything from energy here in the Western Hemisphere and how we can improve that, what the uh, government, the Department of Defense in particular is doing with respect to its energy policy, which is going to affect the entire national energy policy, the research and development work that's being done there, not just because we have so many places in the world that are volatile because of our chase for carbon fuels, but because of the cost of the energy, what it takes to uh, move our large uh, troops any place in the world on that when you start dealing with oil and the other carbon uh, properties on that. So we had hearings all about that. We had hearings about Cuba. We had hearings about Iran. We did a lot of work on Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, some of the work that we, we did in Afghanistan, in fact, uh, threw a spotlight on the fact that we were wasting a tremendous amount of money through the contracting process, the sole contracting in many cases, and the failure to monitor, the failure to have good contracting procedures. We did one uh, report that people saw a note of on the transportation uh, of, of from the forward operating basis on that, where it was billions of dollars at risk, where we just didn't have the processes in place to monitor the security aspect of that. And it turned out that, in fact, some of our taxpayer money was going to warlords, and in some cases, the Taliban. And obviously, we were happy to get that out in the open so that the Pentagon and David Petraeus could put some corrective action in place, and they are doing that. We did the same thing with respect to the oil deliveries uh, out of some of the stands through Russia on that basis and are now currently doing it, unfortunately, on the food contracts where we've claimed back almost a billion uh, dollars in overcharges on several of the contracts and moving forward there. Uh, there's much more we could go into on that. I'm going to leave that for a second. If anybody has questions, they can. But the Education and Labor Committee on which I served was the primary focus when I came here to Congress because I really think that every family sits down and they talk about education, they talk about you know the work, they talk about a job that pays well with benefits, talk about the ability to retire with dignity, provide your family with health care, uh, to make sure that you have an opportunity for your children to get educated from pre-K all the way through lifetime skills. So we spend a lot of time on that and, and Marty uh, made reference to the, the one small provision on that bill which is 
making sure that we keep interest rates low on those opportunities that we have. In 2007, uh, when we were in the majority of the Democrats, we decided that we were really going to focus on access and affordability to higher education. We have been doing that for some time. We put in place a $2,500 tax credit for families to take for educating their family member that was going out to school. We had a continual fight over the years about whether loans should be good through Sally May and other organizations on the private side, where they were guaranteed about 90% repayment, where they were getting subsidized as if they needed an enticement to get into a very lucrative market, or whether we should shift that over onto direct loans, which was our preference to save all that taxpayer money and rechannel it in to access and affordability. That continuing battle culminated in 2007 when we were able to move all of those loans over onto the direct loan side. We saved $61 billion, $61 billion. So with that, we took a chunk and we paid some down on the debt. And we took the remaining money and started to try to bring the value of Pell Grants back to roughly where they were when they were first created in the 1970s. In the 1970s, if you went to school and you had a Pell Grant, it was the equivalent of about three quarters of the cost of a public higher education. We then looked at the loans and we thought that too many families were, regardless of having a decent Pell Grant, because of the increasing cost that Marty spoke about, forced to take out loans. So we wanted to do something about that. We did a number of things. One is we tried to reduce the interest rate, particularly on the need-based loans, the subsidized Stafford loans. So gradually we went from 6.8% down to 3.4%, saves about $1,000 a year on the repayment of, of those loans. We then implemented an income-based repayment plan. So for those students that do have to borrow and have a, a significant amount when they get out, we said that they would pay 15% of the difference between the federal poverty rate and their adjustable gross income. If they paid that every year, some amount that they now could determine that would not be overwhelming, they paid it every year for 25 years and still had a balance that would be forgiven. So two things happen there. One is they understand that they have an obligation that they can pr presumably meet. Uh, and they know what to plan for, now they can go out and buy a house, start a family, do the, 